All right, beautiful people. Welcome to the STOA, the third and final session of Cheryl Shue's Collective Soulmaking Series, uh, which is a research art project investigating the potential of intersubjective cosmopoesis. Um, and yeah, I'm quite enjoying uh, this series. And while it has been a surprise, it was what I was hoping for when I uh, originally invited Cheryl to uh, do something at the STOA. Uh, it's like a mix of embodied theory, entangled interconnectedness, and uh, an experimental container that is weaving different ways of inquiring together. Uh, and I think the private invite move is the, the right one, and it feels appropriate for what Cheryl's doing here. And um, so the title of the, the third, uh, this third session is uh, Participation Mystique, a Metamodern Praxis Experiment in Intersubjective Cosmopoesis. Uh, and hands down, Cheryl definitely wins the word uh, award uh, for most stoa friendly titles uh, consistently. Um, so I appreciate that. And uh, I'm going to take in uh, Cheryl in a moment, and we're here for two hours in total. I don't know what's in store for us today, uh, but I imagine there will be a participation portion. So buckle up for that. And uh, we will have a, a, a fourth session uh, with uh, Benita Roy, I believe, the process what occurred over the last uh, three weeks here at the STOA. Uh, so that being said, uh, Cheryl, I'm taking you in and the STOA is yours. Hmm. Thank you, Peter. And I am welcoming everyone here to the third and final session of Collective Soul Making. This strange experiments that we've all been co-participating in. I'm also aware that, um, again, there's a couple of folks who are new, so I'm going to do a light frame. So this is the third part of a three-part series, and today we will be going into a kind of um, I guess, metamodern theater play around the kinds of uh, philosophical languaging that we love to indulge in in these spaces, these kind of like meta containers that we fractally put on top of concept after concept after concept. So we might be on a bit of a dizzying ride when it comes to language plays, but um, the invitation here is to really kind of play, yeah, it's like play with the philosophy as though it is a game. Don't try to get it. Um, it's more of like a senseful poetry reading than it is um, me explicating something that needs to be conceptually understood and mapped. So with that, um, yeah, hold on to your minds lightly, strap yourselves in and stay close and intimate to your soul and body and whatever it is that you need to be fully present, even if it's standing up or leaving. The permission space is radically open for you to make the choices that you need to make. So with that, I'll pass it over to Nick Shore, who's my co-host for Intersubjective Space. And I'll also name that we are co-hosted also by Amanda Zamparo, who is in Portugal right now, and AJ Bond. Um, and they'll be expertly holding this container with myself, Nick, and Peter. All right, passing it now to Nick. Thank you. Nice to see everybody again. And nice to see the new faces. So just before <clears throat> Cheryl starts to transmit the next portion of this, we open each week a... Um, it, what we've been calling an intersubjective listening container. So just a way of listening 
paying attention to ways of listening to content. And the first week we were, we were saying like, almost like surfing on the content, almost like just ride it, just, just like the roller coaster of it, just let it, let it take you. And then in the second week, we were talking about going on a kind of dr group drug trip together as a way of listening, psych psychedelic listening, almost. Let, let, it, let it go into your bloodstream and affect your consciousness, that way of listening, that shape of listening and looking. So th this week, we were talking a bit about, like, rather than sense-making, listening and looking in a way that's sensing meaning. So, we, you know, if you look at an abstract painting, you don't necessarily try to sense-make it. You just feel it into, like, what's... What is it? What's there? And just let it wash over you and sensing. Sensing like that, sensing meaning, using the whole body as a way of listening. So we're opening this group field. We're just feeling the group field and opening a listening container to hold everything that's about to come into it together. Paying attention. Just hold three seconds of silence just to, so we can feel this group field. It's so thick, it's amazing, it's beautiful, just feel it. Yeah, okay. Thank you, back to you, Sean. Nick, I'm just going to send a message in a pretty out of character fashion uh, because I just finished my hour long uh, morning meditation and found myself gripped by these images. <laughs> visions of being in Europe in like around end of May, June. And yeah, I, I feel like sometimes with these types of things, like I try to discern between, is this the desires of an ego, um, which has that kind of more, I feel like, mechanistic way of following or making sense of what I want because I was meditating I was just feeling the um yeah just like the the potential kind of vibrating in my body and and this sense of I don't really know how it's going to take shape exactly although i i there's definitely contours that are coming through but there is this feeling um that something is concretizing is manifesting is being embodied during that time like all of us build up a potential especially over the past two years there's some kind of yeah some some sense of like concretizing landing um and specifically, uh, yeah, I think I just want to say this out loud to you so I don't, so it doesn't just get stuck in the loop of my brain, but I feel really moved to go to Belgium and I think I'll, I'll send an email to Ria and ask to talk, but just feeling really called to be on her land with her and is Helen and Simon, even, even kind of frankly, like feeling like it's a bit of an apprenticeship. Like I'm kind of wanting Rhea to just put me to work on her garden or something like that, like be with elders. And then this other image of like holding a collective presencing retreat there and bringing together like a lot of the, um, 
European, it, like it, like Eric and Andreas and yeah, just like people who are in Europe who feel also called to, it doesn't have to be like a huge circle or anything like that, but what would it be like for us to really come together and collectively presence? Like, yeah, I feel excitement in my body when I really sense into that possibility of yeah bringing two years of online relationships into like a very intentional embodied gathering and then yeah there's this other piece too which (laughs) feels a little I don't know a, a little crazier but also exciting which is I have this vision of basically um yeah, renting out like a studio in Berlin, um, which is where a good friend of mine from Willow is as well, Nathan. And he's, yeah, he's always someone I've always, I've wanted to bring into collective presencing. But anyway, just like renting a studio there and then just committing myself to making art for like, I don't know how long, a couple of weeks, a month, maybe one week it's I don't want to be overly attached to a particular shape once again but yeah I just like this like again vivid image of being in a studio and just like walls covered with paper and canvas and again this kind of open invitation to people that I've met um through the liminal web, like coming in and holding seance essentially. And I think the reason why I wanted to name that is because you were definitely present. Like there's some part of me that's like, it would be so cool if Nick and I just made art, like committed to making art together in Europe for some period of time. Yeah, I definitely even noticed some shyness in sharing this uh fantasy essentially because again I really kind of share it in that spirit of not clinging to like the particularity of how it's showing up which I think 10 like that's what I notice like is the quality of a lot of these imaginal images like it's not quite like the specificity of how they're showing up but more about the quality it's like what kind like what feeling what felt sense does it induce in my body? Like, does there feel like, is there a sense of real integrity um, and potential that I can feel through, I guess, more of the subtle and energy body? Yeah, so I think just like, definitely this um, feeling of wanting to be brave and just like leap ahead and create and embody and manifest, um, which seems to be kind of also stepping into the uh, astrological um, transit that you've described as well, uh, which I find really interesting because I was already feeling like such intensity around that timing. And then it is always uncanny to have that mirrored back in um, a friend's much more expert understanding of these astrological transits. Yeah. So I think I just want, yeah, I feel like I want to share this because I, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of, um, alchemical, I guess, catalytic creativity. I feel like that comes up in our field. Um, that's very exciting. And, oh, you know what? There's one more piece, which was also holding, collective presencing or like some version of that like an in-person gathering sometime in the fall like late summer early fall in North America as well like feeling like oh there could be this embodied gathering in Europe this year and then also this embodied gathering in North America this year um yeah and and again there was something that felt very aligned about just moving through different parts, like different parts, uh, different sides of the ocean, I guess, the Atlantic Ocean. (sighs) Um, Okay, I feel like I'm definitely speaking from a bit of a 
clustered, um, <laughs> there is no coherent thread here that I can wrap up except for wanting to share some exciting, yeah, exciting, um, an exciting sense of what might be coming ahead. And like the quality of it is, it's often with these type, this type of knowing, it's like, oh, it's kind of already here. It's like, I remember when I went to Willow, there was some sense of, I already knew, some part of me knows it's already happened or is it going to happen? I don't really, yeah, I'm trying to trust that instinct even, even if it means that in kind of out of character fashion, I book a flight to Europe in May and see where it takes me. Um, anyway, I think I'm also sending you this message to see you what inspires you and whether you would want to come along for the ride um, in whatever ways resonates or, or frankly, just like, yeah, what comes up for you in your body, in your imagination, in like the space of potential when you feel into that move towards, again, concretization, manifestation, creativity, embodiment. Um, all right. Okay. I think that's it. Talk soon, Nick. I'm, I'm shaking right now. That's very, it's very, it's quite vulnerable and quite intense for me to share. Um, that was recorded last year, February 4th. And I never experienced something like that really before. I feel really grateful that I sent a voice message to my friend Nick and four months later in June I was in Belgium co-hosting with Nick and Rhea a collective presencing village gathering on her land with 19 other people all from the collective presencing field. A month after that I was in Berlin co-hosting Participasa Mystique with Nick Shore and Nathan Vanderpool. And we gathered 10 people together into a ritual space of 10 days to sense in and make art from the middle. And then a month after that, in August, I found myself in Vermont at the Monastic Academy co-designing with Nathan Vanderpool as the source keeper of Respond, a gathering of teachers in North America around wisdom. It's strange actually that a meditation can unfold so much. For me, meditation is a ritual space. I sit every morning for an hour and I just allow myself to become available. Ritual spaces invite a kind of transformation, a kind of unfoldment that one cannot predict or plan for in the future, or sorry, in the past, but also in the future. And yet you can set up the conditions. You can create the commitments 
the scaffolds of promise to say, yes, I will make myself available to what wants to happen here. So I'm introducing a ritual, Bodies of Water. It was one of the rituals that had come through that felt really kind of, um, it, felt, it borrows, I think it's very much weaved into a lineage of water and the drinking of water and the sensing of bodies of water together interpenetrating as a very powerful ritual practice of sensing into our deep interconnection. So I wanted to invite us, if you got my reminder email earlier, I asked only if you feel called, if you want to enter collective ritual, to bring a glass of water. And if you have your glass of water in front of you, I assume that the water is sourced from wherever you are located, your place in the world. We'll take a drink of it together, but not yet. I want to just set a bit more of a context. So there is a ritual score. A score is kind of like a set of instructions, like um, a way of moving bodies, like you would play notes in a musical score. So here, the ask of the bodies of water ritual is you carry a body of water from your homeland. You carry a body of water in your body. And then you pour the bodies of water into one vessel, place where seas meet. And in that pouring, flows of water diffract, interpenetrate, mutate. And together we nurture alien new life forming together between us. So this was a ritual that I invited the participants of Participasso Mystique who came from all around the world. I invited at first 11 other people, although nine people were actually able to come to Berlin. And I said, please, bring water from your land and bring water in your body. So some examples of where these bodies of water came from are Toronto, Canada, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Filament, New York, London, England, inside a, I think, um, a toothpaste tube, Osogbo, Nigeria, and then of course, the body of water that we gathered around together in Berlin, Germany. So imagining all these places around the world, including the place that you in your body of water, water are rooted to, I'm going to stop this screen share briefly so that we can all see each other. And if you would like to participate in this collective ritual together, you can lift your glass of water to the screen. And let us drink knowing that this is the place where our bodies of water meet. Let's drink. Mm -hmm. 
And like that, we've created a reservoir between us. And that's the reservoir from which I draw as I dive into the rest of this presentation. Thank you. So together, we gather around the watering hole of Participasa Mystique, a metamodern praxis experiment in intersubjective cosmopoesis. So what follows is a kind of, um, you could call it a senseful poetry reading of fragments of a research proposal. And this research proposal has come through a pretty intense deep dive near a black hole. It's collected from the Hawking radiation around the field of participation mystique, which truthfully feels like we called the artist in the middle abysmo because the middle of our field is mystery. So how do you come to understand or make sense of something like mystery? I do the best I can with the method of intersubjective ethnography. And here I'll share with you some of my findings and insights, imagining that this is a research proposal from another time in the future, from another dimension that we won't fully understand now. I don't fully, I cannot fully understand the nature of this proposal. So we'll be on the edge of our knowing together. So as I mentioned, Participasa Mystique came out of the seed of an image in a meditation sit. And over the course of the next month and a half after I received this image, I got in touch with Nick Shore. I got in touch with Nathan Vanderpool, who very excitedly said, yes, I would love to co-host with you and make art together in Berlin. And then I took time, I kept sitting and I sensed into who would be, who would be the other people. And I didn't know how many people it was going to be. All I knew was I needed to sit and just sense and let arrive to me who the others are. Because the mission of the work was pretty audacious. We wanted to gather together. 10 people, 10 days as one artist sensing into the middle. And we wanted to play with a kind of modality of gathering together as a collective organism and as one entity. So rather than simply being 10 artists separately making our works of creative artifacts, we wanted to truly tune into what wants to come through between us a kind of artful interpretation of Thich Nhat Khan's invocation of the next Buddha being the Sangha. So what of the artist, the teacher, the shaman, all of us, we are the middle. So that's the background of Participation Mystique. It is a research art experiment investigating the collective potential of numinous coherence and spontaneous creativity that can erupt through an intersubjective field. All insights and learnings in this proposal arise from the raw wisdom of collective lived experience. The first prototype experiment of participation mystique was a field container of six months that took place between May to October, 2022. It initiated from the image received in a meditation sit on February 4th, 
2022 by Cheryl Shu. Co-hosted with Nick Shore and Nathan Vanderpool, the intention was to enact a new mode of collective process where the locus of creativity shifts from the personal to a transpersonal center. Metabolized from the black box of participas and mystique, the lead researcher offers speculative hypotheses and methodologies. The proposal is to continue a rigorous long-term ethnographic study of the arising phenomenon of intersubjective group creativity. This reflexive praxis is critical to an iterative learning process tracking the emerging patterns of consciousness mutation. Participation Mystique is the praxis component of the tripartite care view action protocols of collective soul whole making. It focuses on the action protocols informing and constitutive from its speculative cosmology, the view protocols of toroidal bodies, our second session, and the imaginal ethos, the care protocols of alchemical soul making, our first session. The triangulation of care view action is borrowed from Nathan Vanderpool's theory of respond, but mimics similar tripartite patterns of trust, power, collective action from Benita Roy, or insolment transcendence develop from Zach Stein, or beauty, truth, and goodness from Plato. <laughs> Collective soul making is a carrier bag investigation with a long view of many generations and lifetimes. The series on the Stoa is also sourced from meditation as a leap of numinous action to F the ineffable, I think that's from Lehman Pascal, and bravely share the imperfection of collective soul making into the liminal commons. Collective soul making guards an audacious calling to source, collect, and cohere glimpses of a larger whole, perhaps a pattern language for an emerging culture and civilization that we may not experience in our lifetimes. It is wisest to consider these experiments as love letters or what Benita Roy calls dispatches to and from the future. So Participas and Mystique had enfolded within it these archetypal immaterials. So we wanted to not work just with painting and dance and drawing, but we also wanted to consider the immaterials, eros, psyche, logos, agape, the words that we love to play around with in these spaces. And it was also very much a container for an ecology of practices. So we wanted to train and embody what it means to do collective soul making. So there were practices around energy cultivation, collective harmonization, imaginal sourcing, and creative experimentation. So there was a sense of, okay, even though I didn't exactly know what participation on Mystique was going to be per se, there were enough protocols and enough of a sense of the shape of what it is that we might step into a kind of emergent patterning together as a group. Because the context is that we need to experiment with radical forms of numinous coherence and collective creativity in this time between worlds. And that's why we call, we call ourselves a liminal web. We keep invoking this time between worlds. So this research proposal comes from that context. It's an offering from a time between worlds, evocatively coined by scholar Zach Stein, to delineate a historical epochal period of significant upheaval and transition. And as we make contact, like true contact, with the manifold complexities and the psychic overwhelm, of what we've been calling existential risk and planetary collapse. We need to source new patterns for collective sensing, collective imagination, and collective creativity. 
as Bio Kamalafe says, yes, the times are urgent. Let us slow down. In the cracks of this collapsing world, the researcher imagines a playful invitation into a new mode of consciousness and spiritual praxis that demands the activation and exaptation of latent capacities of intersubjective creativity. Perhaps this is the integration of what Jean Gebser calls the mythopoetic, magical, and archaic structures of consciousness with the mental. Here, the researcher calls in participasso mystique, a posture and arena of mystical consciousness that re-enchants the animist cosmos into our interpenetrating becoming. So participasso mystique is a praxis of intersubjective cosmopoesis, weaving the lineages of collective presencing and soul-making dharma. Intersubjective cosmopoesis, it's an art and a practice. What we're doing together is sourcing and fabricating new worlds. We're learning how to build worlds. And where this comes from as a practice is related to Dharma teacher Robert Bea, who created the lineage of soul making Dharma with Catherine McGee. And he considers cosmopoiesis not simply as an act of human creation, I just want to do this, but actually of theophanic disclosure and discovery. It is the perceptual projection of eros or divine desire that makes a world. The Dharma is a deeply rigorous practice that inoculates distortions of clinging to projection through the emptiness practices of letting go, but still orients more to individual imaginal practice. Collective presencing, on the other hand, trains the capacity for collective attunement to the intersubjective field, or what Rhea Bach calls the middle of the group. The practice of intersubjective cosmopoiesis explores the creative edge of collective becoming, while the circle of presence cultivates our field of coherence. The circle of creation demands new postures of transversal transmutation. So one of the core, you could say, laws or principles of participation mystique were these. One, when we come together, we follow aliveness or eros. It's that deep sense, that deep felt sense of life force and what it's attracted to and gravitates towards in your body. So as we're generating all this aliveness in the field, two, you transmute that energy through art. Because as my co-host Nick Shore wisely once said, it is irresponsible to generate that much energy without putting it somewhere. So here we put our arrows into art. And three, we remember that the artist is the middle. The artist is the middle. So the hypothesis here is that participation mystique unfolds a set of transversal protocols that can train a mutational capacity in cosmoerotic creativity. So let's take the first principle, follow arrows. Following and holding the tension of creative arrows can be the underlying generator function of collective emergence. What if the intensified tension and agitation felt in this time between worlds can be generatively leveraged as a source of free energy given the right conditions and patterns of holding and transmutation? The arising and movement of free energy can be considered eros, an embodied biopsychic emotional energy that aligns with the patterning of cosmic evolution. As Zach Stein writes in his essay, 
love in a time between worlds. We must learn how to wisely trust and hold Eros as the wellspring from which the actualization of human potential flows. Okay, two. The artist is the middle. What if we can align and amplify our intra, so what happens psychically within, inter, how we relate with each other, other bodies, and trans, what is more than what is simply the bodies here in the space? So the alignment of the intra, inter, and trans subjective fields might lead to a form of what Gene Gepser calls spiritual awareing. And he really describes, I don't fully understand um, the qualities of spiritual awareing, but I might say, I might courageously say that I kind of have like a feeling of what that might be. I've experienced it, glimpses of it in collective presencing. And it's a way of, making reality transparent or diaphanous. So it's that moment where things just become whole. And that's actually a creative form of manifestation or a kind of epiphany. And the interesting thing about spiritual awareness is that it's not like you're lost in a dream. It's actually very, very wakeful. It's very, very clarified. So the proposal here is that a collective intersubjective field can also attune its multi-perspectival awareness to the transparent a-perspectival truth or verity of the middle. As actors in the field feel the shared resonance of something presence, the field can amplify, magnify, and intensify this quality of diaphanous resonance into deeper, wider, vessels of reception. And then transmute into art. Why are we making art? Well, art making invokes a permission and ritual space to leap, experiment, and play. We need to be able to play at the edges of an emerging mode of collective consciousness. It's serious and we have to be daring. We have to know how to be first mover and to make a mark on the page, even when you don't know. This invokes the tension between surrendered flow and receptivity and the disciplined refinement of craft and taste. So you have to both surrender and be disciplined with art. Because as Jeremy Johnson writes, Aesthetics has the potential to become pedagogical in that it holds the promise of teaching us new modes of being in the world. It also has the potential to become a catalyst for dramatic transformations of perception as art finds the hidden voice, the hidden voice that anchors us in the poetics of tomorrow. So as 10 people gathered together into eight days of ritual space in Berlin, we opened the field up to the emergence of ritual artworks. And these ritual containers can be initiated by anyone, just like anyone has the capacity to pick up a paintbrush and paint. Yet here, I would say that a ritual's potency and gravity comes from its integrity in being sourced as a seed of potential from the imaginal realm. So a source keeper, and this is the term that's been arising in the field, Peter actually just sent me a note today asking where Source Keeper comes from. We don't really know. It seems to have come through the field itself. So a Source Keeper recognizes and respects the innate animism of a sourced work, which holds the blueprints of its full life cycle, 
the protocols, laws, and morphology of its enfolded cosmos. So the idea is that when you receive truly a seed from source, the whole world, the whole cosmos is already within it. And that's your role as source keeper. You midwife that through. There were many different rituals that were sourced in the field of participatio mystique, like a scattering of seeds. It's hard to know where they're going to go, what their life cycles are. Much of it has led to fruitions outside of the container. But I'll share some of our rituals. So we had ritual three, the asymmetric mandala. This was initiated by Sam Hines with co-host Nick Shore and Brandon Feingold. And we all collected things, items from the land that felt salient, beautiful to us. We co-created a mandala together, a mandala of asymmetry. There was ritual five, the full moon ritual, initiated by Nick Shore and Margaret Emenio. This invoked the full moon, the time that we were all gathered, and together we created an emergent artwork. So, the idea is that these high capacity containers and numerous coherence can source and embody blueprints from the future. So a vessel or container that is attuned to numerous coherence, I speculate, takes on a toroidal morphology that amplifies arrows and the harmonization of complex potential. All fields are made of bodies and space. So a high capacity vessel is one where bodies can enter a phase state of numinous coherence where each actor is one, harmonized through intra-interpersonal right relationship where each actor is intimately presenced in sovereign surrendered posture, and two, attuned to and can act from the field itself where each actor can also adaptively attune to and move from the transversal awareness of the group field and its own agentic desire. When this happens, the vessel or field of transformation can hold the intensity to meet and flow into a current of divine eros that patterns into the recursive equilibrium and toroidal function of exponential consciousness and creativity. Another word for this, is grace. So intersubjective cosmopoiesis can transmit imaginal worlding through the transversal posture of transmuting generative tension. And when these tensions are well held, it leads to the potential of transversal rupture creative encounters where tensions birth an entirely new emergent whole. This is the transversal line of flight, a highly potentiated departure from the known that can be both creative and destructive. And I'm not gonna read all this, but I just want to say that the seed enfolds within it highly densified information and the gravity of its reality distortion through the density and magnetism of its middle is not unlike a black hole that bends and distorts space-time around it. So, here, another ritual initiated by Nathan Vanderpool, who gathered us together into space, co-hosted with Amanda Zamparo. 
And he invited each of us to sit in front of him when we feel called, if we feel called. And he improvised a soul portrait, gazing at the face of the other, tuned into what the soul wants to know. Seven songs were sourced. We also have Ritual 11, Age of Bonds, initiated by Cheryl Shu, co-hosted by JJ and Nathan, who held the space by playing music. And together, we tied ourselves into an entangled organism of bondage. Entangled, connected, too close and too far apart. Methodology, laws are nature's promises. That's what Benita Roy said when she advised us. So these field protocols, the three principles that I shared follow Eros, transmute into art and the artist is the middle. They are the cosmic laws. And these transversal protocols are the ontological design principles. You could call them the source code or the generator function of emergent behavioral patterns. So like the acorn that holds the oak tree, the sourced image enfolds the whole blueprint and morphology of its cosmos. You have to treat certain principles as laws of this cosmos. You can create ritual artworks as receptor sites of emergence. One of my favorite definitions of rituals from Marion Woodman, who defines ritual as the fashioning of a container out of the very energy that it transforms. And when a ritual artwork is sourced in integrity, it gathers actors, time, and space into right relationship for the containment and transmutation of its energy. Three, you have to provide scaffolds to inform and support the movement of energy. And the purpose of these scaffolds, these structures, these instructions, lightly held, but intentionally crafted, is to hold the kind of energy that is invited in. And Eros actually needs to be able to sometimes rip through these temporary containers. And that's the difference between a paper scaffold and a sourced protocol. There is a difference between the cosmic law and the conditions and scaffolds that you set up to be able to support the movement of energy. So for example, one of the scaffolds that I provided for Participasa Mystique was that we followed the five Buddhist precepts. None of us took intoxicants. None of us were able to sleep with each other. The idea is that when you're generating that much energy, you also need to be able to guide it wisely. So lastly, you have to distribute dynamic responsibility across asymmetric orbital fields. Because the mandala of every cosmos is not flat. It is dynamic and it is asymmetric. And for me, by being in closest proximity to the laws of the cosmos, I was the one who set up the starting conditions. I invited everyone. The source keeper will have the most gravity in the orbital system and therefore the most power to move bodies. And yet, proximity to the source of ritual fields does not need to be fixed. They can move and shift and adapt, but only with conscious intention. It is only through becoming present, and that's our practice, becoming present concretely and not abstractly 
that time and therefore space is rendered translucent, diaphanous in its fullness, its wholeness, the alive order. So the nature of trying to understand participas and mystic or sense make any aspect of it is that it is impossible. It is a hyper object. It is a black hole. It is literally impossible. And yet the urge of human meaning making is to still try to make sense and to loop ideas together and to see connections between images and to find synchronicities between things that feel not coincidental. So there are these images that came through our container that might actually come through different times and different places. And yet there is some kind of pattern that ties them together as though they come from the same source. So I'm not gonna go through the conspiracy wall of participasso mystique because it is endless, but I'll read a fragment from a poem that I wrote with the invitation. The agony of Eros draws loops around pieces. Constellations of divine patterns, a lasso cast by the soul. Light knows when we're looking. Madly, we retrace the eyelash of a god, briefly glimpsed. Ambrosia to fill the senseful hermeneutics of a lifetime. Okay, I'm going to take a drink of water and pause. This is the nature of time dilation. <laughs> this presentation is much bigger and longer than I anticipated. And I want to create space. So I think what comes next in this presentation might go through like a glimpse. I'm not going to read everything, but I will share the place from which it comes. Because working on participasso mystique has a terrible truth to it. As the researcher, the ethnographer, the person studying the potential of collective creativity The second truth when I look again is that it is the most terrible thing I've ever done. What is the research ethics of collective soul making? Participation mystique destroyed me in a lot of ways. It was six months. And on the other side of it, I needed to take actually four months of recovery. And it was a beautiful recovery. It was a beautiful process of simply letting my body recover and heal. And bodies need to recover and heal from wounds. 
So what is the power and responsibility of a source keeper who creates the starting conditions of an experiment that becomes a powerful reality distortion field? What does wise action and harm reduction look like in a cosmos where you are porously intimate with and implicated with everything? How does this not shatter or paralyze you with the unbearable weight of intensified responsibility? Can we consciously assimilate this weirdness or not? When I opened the meta research container in March this year, everything in my body wanted to resist it. I didn't want to come back to participate in mystique. And it was an embodied animal. It was an animal body response. I just didn't want to go back. And yet I needed to take a second look. I needed to take a second look. So what happens when you look again? Fall deeper in love. Because the weight of humanity should overwhelm us. The weight of humanity should overwhelm us. So I'll answer your research ethic questions. How did you recruit your human participants? Well, I seduced everyone. What are the potential harms? Reality distortion, collective psychosis, cult dynamics. What were your protocols of consent? How much can you explain about going through a black hole? Any conflicts of interest? I'm in love with all my subjects of study. Do I get to pass? Because you, and I mean it, everyone here, in this Zoom container, in this ritual container of collective soul making on the Stoa, you should be afraid of me. You should protect your sovereignty from the magnetism of my wanting. I didn't hide it from you. I am the bioluminescent medusoid that leads you down the well weaving reality through a spider's web made of red threads of fate. The gravity of my desire will bend space and time into powerful reality distortion fields. And sometimes my wants are unconscious. I'll do my best to eat the shadow. My longing is as fierce and as hungry as a dragon. It wants to awaken 10,000 souls. It wants to lift a continent from beneath the ocean. It wants ritual containers to amplify its desire to generate toroidal portals to deeper and wider sources of energy. It wants to create the alchemical albatross for the tidal wave of planetary mutation. The fullness is overwhelming. The responsibility is too much. What is the ethics of this wanting? I cannot hold this desire alone. I need you to hold it with me. I need you to hold it with me. So sense in. Does your soul say yes? A no is okay. Will you tell me? I'm not going to read everything here, but I'm reclaiming the temporary autonomous cult because transformation containers are not nice, and I am very interested and what it means to ethically create experimental worlds. Because every world that we create and inhabit is a reality fabrication field. And that's the nature of the responsibility. Whatever you desire, whatever, when you come into contact with your desire, your desire will create a gravity well around it. Your desire will bend reality 
and the worlds of others around its power and therefore its responsibility. So how do we become responsible to each other in these imperfect ritual cult-like containers? We can create feedback protocols of transmission. And yes, there will be blood. So I thought I was studying. I thought I was the researcher, the initiator of Participasa Mystique. But the funny thing is, at some point, you realize that you are not the researcher. You are being researched. And this is the artist in the middle. I call it the Cetician look. It's what the whale belly sees of reality. And you could call it the ascetic truth, which is what documentary filmmaker Werner Herzog describes as not the fact-based truth. It's not me just telling you exactly what happened at Participasso Mystique. It's me longing to communicate to you the beauty, the wounding, the tragedy, the wonder, the ecstasy of participation mystique.
Now, I will invite my co-host, Nick Shore, Amanda Zamparo, and AJ Bond into the circle. Because the nature of something like Participasa Mystique can only really be glimpsed through each of our unique perspectives, an infinite cosmos in each of our experiences. So I'll first invite Amanda to share peace to you. Mm. Ah. Mm. Um. So the image that is coming for me now is an image of me when I was a teenager and I was in high school. I'm back in Brazil. And I was, I would do my homework in the afternoon. I was uh, always very disciplined, disciplined with my homework. And I would always uh, work on everything. And I was, I have this memory of doing my math homework, doing this exercises um, and I would just start feeling very horny in the middle of the afternoon doing my maths um, and I just have this image of this um, energy <sighs> this wanting, I, I don't know even how to call it, it's just horniness is the best word. Um, I would feel so horny that I would have to stop doing my homework and I would have to liberate that energy and I would have to masturbate. And then I would maybe relax a little bit after releasing the energy and then I would go back to my homework. And that was, and sometimes still is, my level of consciousness when it comes to my sexual energy. So when we, when we talk about Eros, um, that's what comes up for me. It's just, what do we do when we feel horny? What do I do with that? Um, and it happened in, in the group, of course. I mean, 10 attractive people uh, that Cheryl invited. And the invitation was to follow, follow that mysterious embodied um, um, energy and then transmuted into art. And that was the first time in my life where I was actually invited to do something with that energy that was not just release in, um, yeah. And I didn't, I had no idea. I, I mean, I was a collective presence and practitioner, but I had no idea what soul making was. And only afterwards, when I was um, uh, what, um, listening to Robert Bea's meditation, I understand the, the depth of this work and what it means to work with, with that kind of energy. Because I remember, again, listening... <laughs> to Rob's, Rob's Berbea's meditation and feeling horny again. And I even messaged Sam and I'm, I'm like, what is this, Sam? 
because I wanted to understand why do I feel this? What do I do with this energy? So th I think for me, this is what this is about. Um, um, yeah, so it, I guess speaking with my experience, speaking about my experience is, is it was the first time in my life where someone said, hey, you can do something with that energy and, and you can create art. And I don't think we know yet how, how to do it. We're, we were just doing it without knowing. Um, and I, I feel excited because I think there's much more to learn about that. Um, Hmm. Yes, and abismo means abyss in Portuguese. Um, and that was my feeling being around, being in the circle. In the first day we were in Berlin, it just felt like facing this abyss and really because sometimes we talk about not knowing but what is it really like to be in a group of 10 people and really not know what we are doing so I just just felt like facing this abyss and asking everyone to jump and yeah, I mean, I, I think that's me for now. Thank you. And I think Nick is the next one. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> mm. Thought it might be good to show a couple of images as my way of reflecting. I made so much art during, before, during, and after participation mystique related to the experience. I thought it might be an easier way for me. I did metabolize that experience through art and I did, I did try to, and naturally anyway, did um, transmute much of what was happening into, into art. So. I just want to share my screen here. Second. Just want to wind back the clock a little bit um, to 2019. So a full, a full, um, almost three years. Yes, three years before we were even in the planning phase of participation mystique. I I had um, a lot of energy go through me. Um, just as a kind of opening or something like that that happened to me all by itself and in that experience I was drawing a lot and making a lot of art I didn't know what else to do with the energy it just seemed to do that by itself almost and uh, I drew hundreds thousands of images from it but but many of them contained eyes eyes and um, I just pull these three that show the sequence that happened is first the images of eyes, an eye arising from within my body started to come through. So I drew that many times. And then there was, oh, I suppose it was my body, but then, then it became this character. It wasn't even me anymore. That was covered in eyes from head to foot. That was just fully an eye person. That's the second one below. And then as the space potentiated more, as the energy went to a higher frequency, it was as if all of space around me became an eye or many eyes fractally and space itself started to wake up or something like that. And I was trying to paint that. If I'd been able to paint that image on the right, um, I would have made it four dimensional, three dimensional, like the inside of a cube where every surface was a mirror reflecting eyes. Like that. So I, I show those only because in the lead up to the gathering, as we were getting ready to do it, and then we were doing field building, pre-gathering, 
images started to come again. And I think that what was happening was the, the container, we were already hitting some of those frequencies that I'd experienced in 19. And uh, I started to see like galaxies, whole spiral galaxies of eyes coming out from a central point. And each eye was like a universe in itself. It was like galaxies upon galaxies spiraling out like that. I started to draw that. And then also I started to see mandalas that were like made of eyes on the right that were keys that would open different dimensions. They were almost like spatial keys, cosmic keys. And I was drawing them on the right. And they was sort of fever dreamish, but we'd have field gathering meetings. And then I would start to draw from the, from the energy of the, of the pre-meetings. And then in the gathering itself, that really came online. I'm just, I'm picking on one, just one line of energy, but we were drawing many things from many different, the Cheryl showed many different directions. But this eye motif exploded in the gathering and the whole space felt like it was alive and, and, and optically alive. And these were drawings that were trying to get at that. It felt like, felt like cosmic, eye space opened <laughs> around us and at one point i couldn't close my eyes because if i closed my eyes and we didn't take any drugs or anything like that in the space but if i closed my eyes there was so much there was so much uh consciousness within the consciousness of the space like it was like millions of eyes exploding like popcorn and i couldn't do it i had to like keep my eyes open because i felt like i was going to lose my mind at one point because this the space was so potentiated with self-awareness uh, like that um, in the gathering. And just show these two images. I didn't know about these uh, images during participation mystique, but I found them afterwards. Um, uh, on the left is, I think it's Greco-Roman God who's covered in eyes, Argos apparently. I, I don't know who was beheaded by Hermes. I don't know these things. I'm not. I'm, I'm the son of a coal miner, so I don't have any knowledge of these such things. But um, I was like, shit, there's a guy covered in eyes. Like, wow, I've never seen that before. And also is connected to Hermes. Um, and Hermes is the one on the right that's going through the veil. So, and looking, peering through the veil into, interdimensionally. And that is, if I had to summarize, in essence, what I felt like happened to me in participation Misty is that space around us and within us and between us became so potentiated with a high frequency energy that we were able to see through i could see through reality we were able to see through reality maybe i could felt in a way that you know i, I didn't I, I never had it encountered before like that not really um and so it had that quality of charles said, charles said i think diaphanous quality it's like Reality just went transparent like that. And we could just stick our head through like that and look through other stuff that wasn't there, visible to the naked eye. And like my whole body was covered in eyes, it felt like. So it felt like the thing that happened to me in 2019 was almost like a, a premonition of what was going to happen in this experience. And in Berlin, I felt like I was, I'd been training for two and a half, three years to be there without knowing that I was doing that. That's how I felt when I was there. I felt like I was exactly where I was supposed to be. And that the universe had been training me for it um, as part of holding that. Yeah, that's my experience. Or oh, one, one version of my experience. So I'm um, going to pass it over to AJ. Ooh, I feel very. Um... My heart is is racing. I feel emotion welling up. Uh, I've been like trembling a bit through this presentation, and um, I've been I've been feeling frustration with the limitation of words. It's like Cheryl is using these words. I'm like, okay, I get it that that word like means this thing, but. It just, for me, it's so far from what the thing it's pointing to is or was like. And the, the thing 
that it's pointing to is so for me so in many ways raw and human and organic and and um painful and joyful and so there's something about like just wishing these words could more directly convey some experience and uh I was appreciating Nick that your art I was like oh that's closer to to like encapsulating what I feel in relation to the words that are describing this experience um. Yeah, and another thing that stands out for me, um, a couple times, Cheryl, I heard you using the words we. Um, the first time I noticed was like talking about the artist in the middle. You were like, well, we want to do this thing in relation to the artist in the middle. And I was like, it occurred to me that it's like, no, I don't. <laughs> Not really, no. And another time you said like, we like to use these words like eros and you know, there was, you know, and I was like, no, no, I don't. I don't. But it it gave me a window into the experience of um how to describe it. Coming to Cheryl's creation, her invitation, and wanting to submit to it in a way, wanting to help her create what. I thought she wanted to create. And so in a way, though, it's not completely in my arrows to, to go into the artist in the middle. I'm like, okay, I'm a yes, and I'm going to try, and I'm going to try to do that. And, and though it's like, these aren't my words, I'm like, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to co-create what the leader wants. And it, it's, it's opening up for me like this tension, this polarity of how do I honor the vision of the source keeper and, and, and co-create it with them? Because I want to, I want to help them and I want to connect with them and I want to see their vision through. And yet, where's the line of holding on to myself and my sovereignty? And so there's, a, you know, I, I appreciated the language around the cult because that's sort of what it's like. It's like I'm submitting myself to the source keeper's ideas, their language, their their eros. And uh, somewhere in that process, I think I lost myself to some degree. So it really did become a cult for me. I, I became a member of the cult. And I, I consciously did that. I was like, I'm here to be part of this and to fulfill this. And the arrows for me that I brought was, well, how honest can I be? That's like, for me, my art was interpersonal. How honest can I be with everyone about my truth? Uh, what can we co-create in relationship here? And that sort of seemed like where I was called in this journey is, is to bring up my skepticism, to bring up my judgment um like we saw you know nathan he did these beautiful soul portrait songs he improvised a song for each of us and then it, i was like oh my truth is i don't like my song like can i say that can i share that with nathan like is is that okay and from this nervous system right here that is like not a comfortable uh, normally okay thing to do And then I, I, the way I interpret the, the rupture that occurred is that my truth was that I thought I saw something in the field that hadn't been disclosed. I, I thought I saw a kind of dangerous secret. And I, my kind of ultimate truth thing was like, can I, 
can I say that I think I see this thing? And, uh, and, and that, that was a rupture. That was sort of like my worst fear of truth that it would cause like a rupture. And that's, that's when it became like a, a very painful experience because it was like, I, I join a cult. I want so badly to be part of it, to connect, to help it, to nurture it. And then the sense of like, oh, I destroyed it. I, 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 and, and, and I'm like, I'm, I'm torn from it, both physically, because like it ended and sort of like emotionally torn from it. And I really did come away feeling like if, if the leader like has a way to be destroyed, the participants will find it and like push the button. This, this is sort of what it felt like I did. I like searched for some kind of unsaid, unseen bomb and then turned it on and and and, and exploded everything um so i kind of take away like how can we this this the the capacity you know Cheryl being the the participant the study subject like i i felt that's so true that there was a of, of something like a if you can be triggered it will be found <laughs> and, and that sort of felt like that was my role maybe and that um was painful and scary um but then uh we just kept going and I just kept showing up and the desire to like fall and hide in shame. I just sort of like brought that and, and didn't like um, actualize it, but, but it was there. And I, I guess I want to say like, it has like a happy ending to me that through the kind of keep showing up, through Cheryl's grace in repairing there's now like a stronger connection than before it exploded and i think i'd be kind of curious to know like if Cheryl kind of like agrees with this idea of like a a bomb that could be found and triggered. I'm curious what that, how that has transformed through being, lighting the fuse of it. That's what I have to say. <clears throat> Thank you. So perhaps Cheryl will want to answer that question in the next section is we're gonna open the floor in a limited way right now for about 10 minutes to maybe a little bit longer for just anybody that was in the participation on the state gathering because there were four more here that weren't co-hosting there's sam and brandon nathan and jj also here but also including those that have shared amanda cheryl me and um, aj so just a little bit of a fishbowl of any kind of dialogue between us anything that wants to be said reflections and then for the last 10 15 minutes we'll open the floor to everybody but for right now, just PM PMs, sort of reflecting on. Floors open.
I feel like I, I wasn't ready for this. Yeah. And I kept collapsing. And not ready. And then <clears throat> you make art out of that and knows you made me continue to come back, I guess, and sort of just wrestle with the dance. And um, I think when we were together in Berlin, I, I managed to be with it. And, uh, Nathan, it's a little hard to hear you. Is there any way to just come a bit closer to the mic or something? It's just a touch hard to hear you. Just the sure. Is it better now? I can close it. Okay. Yeah, I, I think when we got to Berlin, I was able to hold it somehow. Not even in Berlin. At first in Berlin, I was falling apart. And then we got to this house outside of Berlin. And it just like I was able to kind of like hold the field of like, Whatever you want to call that reality distortion, I think it's like a, just a different reality. I don't know. I'm, if it's distortion, I'm distorted all the time anyway. But there was a different reality field that opened up, um, and it was incredibly beautiful and changed something in me, and I think supplanted something in me that over the last nearly a year now has like grown into quite a powerful resource for me. That's what I'd like to say. Um, hmm. resonating with what AJ was saying about words a moment ago. Um, there's more than can be said, but one phrase that comes to me is hyperbolic karma chamber. Um, hyperbolic karma chamber. But the thing is, there's like... <laughs> in some ways, an intelligence to it, because the things that were hyperbolically amplified, huh, the word alignment comes. Falling out of alignment, there was like a feedback coming from the system or something like that. Um, that in some ways, in ways that could often feel quite harsh, um, it was like the intelligence of the field wanted to keep me in alignment with myself, even when things were intense. Um, just you know, the, the image of the we called the the artist in the middle abysmo, but the image of the abyss was so present throughout that whole process, <laughs> and. Yeah, really having this sense that um, hmm. eros and creativity <laughs> can be beautiful and elating and uplifting, and sometimes it's it feels like fire and brimstone, and that can still be eros, actually. Um, Yeah, and so, <laughs> yeah, and oh, just one thing I want to say is that, uh, yeah, I went to some of the deepest, most challenging places I think I've been psychologically in my soul. Um, and this phrase from Sri Aurobindo has been ringing with me for a while. It's, uh, by your stumbling, the world is perfected. So I... I have a sense that what can feel like erring and what can feel like it's off or wrong. Mm. Few things have catalyzed my wisdom hunger more than the pain that I experienced in that process uh, during participation mystique. So I'm just grateful for that. Yeah, just 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 hope. I hope many of us keep taking the keep taking those leaps uh, and getting getting swept up in these uh, hyperbolic karma chambers and being in our abyss with as much love and grace as we can. That's 
just a fragment of what I've taken from from this experience. But yeah, that feels that feels complete for me. One small comment I'd like to make is how amazingly different individuals' experiences were of the same event. Um, remarkably different, almost not even a different space, a different world almost at times. Just that in itself is an interesting epiphenomenon. Okay. Um, just just then Sam said like when it was intense I feel like the whole thing was like kind of intense pretty much um yeah there was this like intensity of just and just uh, this this like non-stopness of it and like yeah just this like confronting um I was I was really challenged to like kind of show up and participate in in ways that have been and have felt scary. Um, but as that will come was coming to mind, I think Bonnie often says um, like voluntary obligation, uh, and it's like you know we said that initial yes, and like so we you know we'd put ourselves in that position um, in that situation, and then just the intensity <laughs> just raining down um and just having to just like be there with it and just like just really showing up like kind of wherever that's like with like being there like honestly openly in interpersonal relationships like with like creativity just like making a commitment you know for me i was like i'm gonna write something every single night like kind of and like just having that consistency and just even nights nice, we just like literally just drag myself up just up to bed and just being like, no, I've, I've made this commitment and just like, I'm going to show up for myself. Um, yeah, it catalyzed a lot for me as well. Um, yeah, even with, with the poetry, it's hard to put into words. But it's, you know, there's, there's still, things that are still turning and germinating. Um, yeah. I'm I'm very grateful for it and yeah, hella challenging and yeah. That's yeah, it was a very intense experience for me as well but the word challenging doesn't really resonate with me it was like the part parts of me that love crave intensity were being fed and um yeah i was just riding that and i i guess i was also like i don't know if lucky is the right word but i wasn't confronted with like personal stuff that was not that, not not that there was nothing that came up personally but it wasn't stuff that was um challenging to navigate or like new and surprising um and it felt like that i had this container this container was available to me that was able to hold whatever was coming up inside of me and me in relation to the field and that there were spaces to I mean, the whole the whole container was designed to transmute whatever I was experiencing into art. So, um, yeah, the the support was there. The, the... Yeah, it felt really great to be able to take risks. I took a lot of big risks. Um, I loved how. You know, it felt like we were just all playing in a sandbox with each of us in our in our superpower modes, um, just much more frequently than we otherwise would be. It's always 
yeah, I felt like the, the baton was just being passed between us from, okay, it's your turn to like show us your superpower and for us to the rest of us to be invited into it and then the next one and and then combinations of superpowers and then yeah i really started to sense how like feeling what each of our niches were like not only in this specific container but also just in the bigger picture um and Yeah, like starting to see what it means to um, be the crew of a ship together and not that everyone is going to have, not that everyone is going to only be responsible for their exact role or assignment, that there was also fluidity, but that like there was trust that I knew that yo, I knew that Nick knew what his role was and I can trust him that he was going to take care of that and vice versa and that I would have his back if for some reason he was incapacitated to fully fulfill his role that I had the, the tools as well to like come in and I'll put the piece back there. I just want to add really quickly that like um, <clears throat> this image that I that by the end of that week of ten days things were getting so intense like it was it was so over the top we were all like completely beyond what we would be able to handle somehow and and I woke up and it was like six in the morning and I look down through a window and I just remember this image of like Cheryl meditating by herself in the room where we're making art it's holding that and I just find it important to emphasize like how much your dedication and discipline Cheryl created the possibility for this to open up as far as it did and I want to yeah, I'll second that. I think we all would. And so we have only about 10 minutes left. So I'd just like to open the floor for a combination of checkouts, just from the whole kind of three session experience, if anybody would like to check out or checkouts from this particular session in the spirit of what needs to be said through you as a way to check out of the space. Floors open for anybody using the talking piece. I also, I want to pick up, something's been present with me. Um, <laughs> hmm, feels really, feels really, really, it's like struggling to be articulated. I, <laughs> okay, I'll start with the story. I remember when I was at Willow for three months in a container that Daniel Thorson was actually holding for seven us, seven of us, eight of us together. Nate, that's how I met Nathan. I remember um, we would always check in every morning. So we would wake up every morning and check in after our like meditation and our chanting and our everything. And I would always say, <laughs> I think I would, I was saying that I was feeling intensity enough that at some point, Daniel was just like, Cheryl, you keep saying that you feel intense. What does that even mean? What does intensity mean? <laughs> and it's just so interesting because as I was sitting here and everyone was just saying it was so intense. It was like, I was hearing that echoed back at me again. I was like, what is that intensity? Like, what is it? What is it when you're feeling so intense that there's no other word than to just say the word intense all the time? And I think there's just something around that that word is just deeply like present in this field. And 
yeah, I invite us to be intimate with intensity and what that feels like. And to be okay if it's scary as well. There's like also folks who are not here from Participasa Mystique. And I want to invoke them into their space. Maya Apollonia Road and Margaret Amenio, Cristiano Siri and Italia Vajno. Okay, thank you. Peace in the middle for checkouts. I will pick up. I am very grateful for what I'm feeling is I'm making friends with bombs, making friends with cracks, making friends with disruptions. I feel it from all of you. I'll pick up. Um, hello, everyone. Hi, Cheryl. Um, so often listening to these is like uh, listening to a trip report, and you wonder if you really should be listening to someone's integration with their initiatory <laughs> dreaming. Um, but maybe it's because y'all did this in, in Berlin or something, but I wanted to bring out, um, so where we get the term horniness from, is um, from the god Pan, that's a half person, half goat. And that's also where we get the word panic from. And that's also where we get the word satirical from. So that comedy satire. And I think it's interesting that all three of those are um, coming from the exact same source and that theater, especially very um, potent forms of theater, uh, almost like frenzied theater or, you know, uh, liminal theater can sort of hold these uh, ruptures. It's like the rupture that can hold all ruptures or the container that can hold all containers. Um, and I just want to bring that in because for me as a theater maker and trained in certain strange physical theater styles, that has been deeply helpful in dealing with um, sort of the the nonsense making of the unraveling of, of sort of human uh, sense making or safety or sanity or whatever um, without necessarily causing harm. So I would just say that if you're feeling all those things, there are antecedents or precedents in history, especially European history, but also in African history that can um, help uh, sort of Cohere the incoherable. So I just want to say that. I want to pick up the piece and I want to voice what is intensity for me when you were sharing those words, Sarah, it came very clear that it, um, it's when my waters, um, I'm not so calm in my body. So we're going through, or it's when I'm going through things that move them. And that's when I feel it's intense. And it can be 
a pleasant sensation and or not. Um, and I want to just thank you for inviting me and giving this opportunity to everyone um, to go through your work and your beautiful unfolding. And that was also an intense journey for me to witness. Thank you. Okay, we're at the bottom of the hour. I like what Nathan shared. I want to read it out loud. Sometimes things become possible if we want them bad enough. It's a pretty good summary of this whole series in a way. Also, be careful with what you want. I want to say um, just one last thing. This was an intense experience. This was an intense experience for me. Perhaps it was intense for some of you. Um, there's like a desire to actually hold container for our integration together, for our reflection, for our metabolism, because we all drink water together. We're all part of this field, except for the folks who didn't, in which case I... Um, applaud you for honoring your sovereignty, actually. So um, next week, next Friday, there will be another session. It will not require me to spend an entire week <laughs> going through a process of creating um, a piece which relieves my system. And it's an invitation, actually, into a feedback playground. And just for all of us, should we feel called to come together and share our experiences and perhaps in the midst of that sharing come through to some form of beauty wonder or insight it will be next monday so same time and if any i'll send a follow-up invitation um, and similar to the protocols of the last sessions, if you want to come, just send me an email and I'll add you to the Google invite. So that'll be a space for us to regather and process. Okay. Thank you so much for joining Collective Soul Making. Thank you, Peter, for holding space at the STOA as the steward. Thank you, Nick, for being my intersubjective space co-host. Thank you, Bonnie, for being Bonnie and holding space next week as well. And there's so many other thank yous. Like, thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And take care of yourselves. Take care of your bodies of water. And uh, let's jump off mute and thank Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank, thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl. Thank you, 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 we love you, we love you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>